last three days of last week, and he's out of town all this week. I'm out of town on Friday, but he'll be back on Friday, so I'll be doing the next four lectures. And we haven't even uh, seen each other to talk about uh, what's the week after that. However, that Monday is a holiday, so you can have that day off. Uh, President's Day. Uh, we'll figure out uh, what the schedule is. We're hoping to, um, well, if his module is going to be about eight, eight lectures, mine's going to be a dozen, so 20, 20 lectures will finish up in early March with the lectures, and uh, then I'll probably give you a week or a week and a half or something, and then we'll start the uh, presentation. And there's over 30 people in the class now. I don't know exactly how many. I'm not going to, well, I'm not going to pass the sign-up sheet around unless someone hasn't signed up. Um, I think most people are probably signed up now. And so eventually I will start working for that to put together a schedule. I'll probably send a stellar memo around uh, about any days that you can't do it. Now, um, so far as the schedule goes, we will videotape the presentations. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the presentations here in a second. But in fact, maybe you're going to, you want to, are we on direct recording now? Okay. So we'll videotape the, the presentations. And even if you can't make it to class, you're expected to watch 20 of the presentations. You don't have to watch all 32 or 35 or whatever it is. Only I have to do that. Okay. Uh, now, a number of students in the past have watched them all because they, they like the presentations. They learn from them. I learned quite a bit from them, too. Uh, some of you actually know something about what you're talking about. So, uh, particularly if I let you do it on any topic you want. Okay? You, people usually pick a topic they know something about. In any case, um, there, it was held in the scheduling, and I'll have to check. Last year, we did. We did. Uh, we actually were able to get this room from nine to eleven, and so some days we actually did six presentations. And some students can't make it nine to ten. I mean, one of the advantages of doing a video tape class that's a live class too is some students can take this class um, even though they have conflicts with other classes. More and more faculty in the institute don't just do Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, or Tuesday and Thursday at a particular hour. They throw in a class, you know, they might be lecturing at, at 11 o'clock and they'll throw in a Wednesday morning class at 9 a.m. as if there's no, that doesn't screw up the schedule for another class, okay? So there's some students who have written to me and said, I can't come on Wednesdays, but I'd like to take your course. I said, fine, you can watch the Wednesday, the videos from Wednesday. Um, it's Tally, you, what are we going to get these up on YouTube? They're not yet, right? Um, after this class. Okay, I mean... Hopefully we'll get them, once we get things started and, and stuff, they will be going up within a couple of class days. But you don't have to study for a quiz, so you don't have to worry about that. It's just a question of, you know, keeping up. But if we finish all the live lectures, now some, uh, by um, early March, then you've got plenty of time before and I have to put the grades in in mid-May. Um, some students are taking all three modules uh, online, which is fine with me. You don't have to come to a live lecture. Um, I actually think this is sort of synchronous, asynchronous learning, okay? Uh, uh, but in any case, um, so far as the presentations go, well, what, what we've decided, whatever modules you take, we'd like you to do a one-page kind of summary of what you think you got out of the module, okay? Can you do bullet points of what what the key points were if you had to give the, you know, the, uh, the two-minute elevator talk is? You ever heard of that? You know, something to talk about over at Sloan School. You gotta be, if you happen to get on the, the elevator with the CEO of the, the big company, you got to be able to tell everything you know in two minutes while you're on the elevator. Okay, so give us a short little summary of, of what you think the key points were in whatever we're doing. So far as the presentation goes, you're going to have 10 minutes. Now, there's going to be about five minutes, or actually really about another 10 minutes, approximately, for questions and answers so the, the other students can ask you some questions. If you go over 10 minutes, um, I will be timing it, and I will stand up. And after 11 minutes, I will slowly start walking towards you. And if it gets to be 12 minutes, you don't want me to catch you. Okay. Uh, I think I've 
one and had to, in all these years, only had to tell a student their time was up completely. Okay, after 12 minutes long. But what that means is you should not have more than 10 PowerPoint slides. Okay? You can't do more than one PowerPoint slide a minute. That's just a good rule of thumb, and I've got a lot of empirical data to support that. So, um, and you ought to think about how you're going to organize your presentation. Um, uh, it's harder to give a short presentation than it is to give a long presentation. Okay? Some famous person once said, uh, I was asked to give a talk, he says, it, it depends. If, you want me to, if you're going to give me two hours, I can, I can do it right now, but if you want it done in 20 minutes, I'll have to prepare. Okay. Um, so, any questions on the presentation? Any topic you like, hopefully it might somehow relate to materials, because I take a pretty broad view of materials. And some students will come in and they'll present a thesis proposal or something. I don't care if you've already prepared the talk or if it's something you did this summer. It's supposed to be something that's going to be informative to the other students and to me. Okay? Something you're interested in. Any questions? No? Okay. Well, today I wanted to talk about the question that I was asked before I get into the, the main things that we're going to do. I was, I was going to answer a question that I was asked by Technology Review about two weeks ago. Uh, anybody know what Technology Review is? It's a magazine that MIT puts out. Yeah, it's a magazine that MIT puts out. You ever heard of James Ryan Killian? Became president of MIT, the chairman of the corporation. He earned 23 honorary doctorates. He never got a real doctorate, but he had 23 honorary ones. He was President Eisen. He was the first science advisor to President Eisenhower. Okay, first science advisor ever. He was science advisor to President Eisenhower. Jim Killian started at MIT in like 1925 as the editor of Technology Review, which is MIT's news magazine. And it's actually read by like 60,000 people around the world. And a lot of them are people who are like congressional staffers and stuff. And people who sort of in the know, they don't go to the Wall Street Journal for looking at what's new and upcoming technology. They go to the Technology Review, okay? Because supposedly it has a critical, you know, it has the MIT imprimatur of, of uh, being um, a little more in-depth than the trash you get in the Wall Street Journal, okay? Um, so that's not much of a recommendation that we're better than trash, but you know, we are, <laughs> okay? Okay, anyway, so I'm going to talk about 3D printing because they asked me a question about it, but I just wanted to do a review of the last time, and I put up this slide which basically says, we're going to talk about selection of structural materials. And structural materials are usually used in very large volumes, whereas functional materials can be a catalyst or something. These things can be used in micrograms, OK? Uh, and you hear a lot about nanotechnology. Most of the nanotechnology is going to be in functional materials, OK? There are electronic and optical and chemical and magnetic properties, you know, uh, storage. Uh, uh, computer storage devices, you know, magnetic properties, uh, typically. The mechanical properties for structural materials are what you're mostly interested in. Okay, so that's that's just generally. And the question they asked me, they came to me and they said, um, we'd like to interview you on why there is um, why no 3D printing of metals. That was the question they asked. Um, everybody know what 3D printing is? Most people are nodding their heads. It's all over the Wall Street Journal. Additive manufacturing and things. And this is the original. This was called stereolithography. It was invented by a guy down at University of Texas A&M, was it? It was called stereolithography in the mid-80s when he invented it. And he basically had a bath of liquid polymer resin that was a uh, photochromic type of resin. And he had two laser beams. It doesn't show two of them, but it shows a scanner with a laser. And where the, where the two lasers would come together and intersect, you'd have greater heat intensity. And that greater heat intensity with the UV, uh, I guess it's UV, I don't know if it's UV or not. But anyway, 
would basically cause the liquid polymer to polymerize, and he could build up a three-dimensional object by scanning these intersecting beams. Um, like the National Academy of Engineering for coming up with this idea. So about four or five years later, two guys here at MIT, does anybody who coined the term 3D printing, they were here at MIT, one in mechanical engineering and one in materials engineering? No one knows? That's just me. Professor Sima was one, yes, I am. Sachs. Professor Ellie Sachs and Michael Sima on funding from the Leaders for Manufacturing Program. We had someone here from the LGO program. Um, they had some initial funding from the Leaders for Manufacturing program and um, 2D dot matrix printers were already available and they had the clever idea. Well, why don't we essentially take that same print head and instead of using ink, let's make our own ink that's a ceramic slurry and let's squirt out and 3D print a layer by layer um, some um, ceramic materials. This happens to be something I took off the web this morning. This is a complex shape in ceramic. Okay, so I just gave you two examples um, of the original serial lithography where it was plastics and then um, uh, the first thing that <coughs> Seema and Ali Sachs did were they came up, they coined the term 3D printing, which now has become a generic term, and they just used a, a little $300 uh, 2D printer printhead, and then they had a little table that would go up and down and, and traverse around and, and stuff. Um, and so they started making parts. Anybody know what the original parts were 25 years ago? One of the, some of the first parts they made were they made ceramic molds to be able to make medical devices like artificial hips. And why would someone, why would that be an early adoption? Adopting for this technology. Do I have any idea? Customizable. Customizable to the individual. That's one, yes. Cost. Well. Cost, okay. So it's customizable, you know, and there's the cost thing is they're very how the high value added products. I mean, they're selling these artificial hip, you know, these, you know, these little things with the ball on them and metal, metal pieces. They're selling them for I don't know, three or five or ten thousand dollars, depending on how complex they are, and so you can afford to do something that's very slow. Okay, now they couldn't make metal parts because to melt the metal parts is very very high temperatures, but it's easy. Just put down a little ceramic slurry at room temperature and build up the customizable parts. And the whole big thing back then was the CAD system to make up a nice simple geometry. Well complex geometry, but do it simply, okay? So it was the interfacing of the, uh, taking the CAD design from the computer and turning it into a 3D printing program that would run the machine that would make these CAD, these molds. Ceramic molds, well, that's what you cast metals in anyway. That was early adoption. And then, um, did I tell you the story about, I had a, uh, an LGO, an L LFM student that was making, uh, when they were first trying to, to make these little enzyme strips for testing blood sugar for diet, people who have diabetes. Anybody familiar with these little things? Little, little plastic strip, or composite strip, and there's a little meter, I guess I have one in my office that you should have brought in, but you prick your finger, you get some blood, you put a little blood on this thing, and there's some enzyme in that strip, it costs $10,000 a gallon, it's not cheap. And they were trying to put some of this enzyme, these different enzymes on these strips so that you could test your blood sugar. Everybody could test it. You could prick it in your finger five times a day if you want, okay? And you could test your blood sugar. And they were trying to do it as a continuous stream flow. And I remember they were having terrible quality control problems. And I said, why don't you get a 3D, why don't you get a 2D print head and just print the enzyme onto these little strips and you'll know how much you have. Well, it turns out one of the second big applications for 3D printing was not that, and I'll bet you now that that company, which refused to, to listen, I'll bet you that they actually are using some of this technology to just print little drops to put some of this enzyme on, was the first, one of the first things was for making pills for the pharma, pharmaceutical industry, okay? Most of the pill you take is just 
calcium carbonate limestone, okay? It's just something that's pretty non-toxic. I mean, calcium carbonate is sort of like milk of magnesium, which is magnesium carbonate. You know, take that for an upset stomach, right? Well, you can take calcium carbonate. Um, it's not toxic. And that's just the carrier for the real drug, okay? And so they actually, one of the problems in mixing up powders and popping out pills for the pharmaceuticals industry is make sure you get the powders mixed up. You know, you know mark, ma uh, mix them in large volumes. Well, they're not always homogeneous when you start making little pills out of large volumes. So they were actually 3D printing, actually 2D printing, sort of, the drugs into the pill. Okay, so they got a nice uniform dose. Okay, so those are some of the early things. Um, people tried to make metals. In fact, I had a, a research contract back in the early 90s. I, they gave me research money because I was an LFM professor, and I didn't need the money. And so I gave the money to Professor Sonnen over in mechanical engineering because he wanted to do 3D printing of printed circuit boards. And this would be great. You could make a one-of-a-kind printed circuit board, right? You know what a printed circuit board looks like. Okay. I think I have a printed circuit board here that will kill myself. Um, yeah. So here's a, here's a printed circuit board. Uh, this is sort of a thick one. It's got, uh, this one I think has 21 layers. It has some metal on some plastic. It has a bunch of layers through the thickness. This one comes from one that's about 24 inches by 36 inches, just saw cut out. This is basically what Cisco routers put their little chips on. And these things are worth a fortune once you start with filling this thing two feet by three feet with printed circuit boards or with chips. So they wanted to be able to customize one of a kind uh, print turn certain boards. And it turns out I was also working with Motorola. They had a little company down south of here in Boston off, off uh, 128, and they were trying to do the same thing. It never worked. Okay. Uh, people would still love to do it, but no one's been able to make just something as simple as printing the print circuit board out of metal. Okay. So that's so that's why now 25 years later they're asking me the question. Why don't they do it? Well, it turns out I had a project back in the early 90s, actually mid-90s, to try to make some parts by 3D printing, because that's what it became known as. And uh, I have some of the parts here, OK? I think we got it to work. Uh, I'll pass some of these things around. This is an Inconel super alloy done by Electron Beam. 3D printing, I guess, show it to everybody. It's just a, a metal part, and we laid down strips, and cladding uh, of, I guess, you know, uh, 100 or I can't remember, something like that. Um, we did some stainless steel. I'll pass this around after. We did some uh, aluminum, uh, magnesium aluminum bronze, because the Navy was paying for this, and they like to make propellers. Um, and whatnot. And I think we came up with the way to, to do it if you wanted, but the equipment was probably going to cost a minimum of $10, $10 million, okay, to make big parts. That's what we were focusing on, was to make, to make big parts. Okay, so there's the, now 25 years later, people are still not making uh, a lot of 3D metal parts. And why? Well, um, you can ask, the Japanese have something they call the five whys. Has anyone ever heard of the five whys before? Okay, you have. What's the five whys? It's a uh, process for going down the line of reasoning as to what the root cause of the problem. Right. Uh, did I actually talk about this last time? No, I don't think I did. Anyway. So I give the example of, um, if you want to get to the root cause of the problem, a few years ago I tried <coughs> Philadelphia, um, an Amtrak train, uh, jumped the rails as it was coming into 30th Street Station in Philadelphia. And the question was, why did he, why did the train jump the rails? Well, it turns out the first why was, the answer to that was, well, he's doing 50 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour zone. It was around a curve. If you go too fast around a curve, you jump the rails. Well, why was he going 50 miles an hour? Well, he was on drugs. Okay. I, you know, I, and you can do the same thing with uh, 
MTA cars and stuff like that around here. You just keep asking the question. And there's nothing magic about five whys. It could be four whys, it could be seven whys, but if you keep asking why, like a three-year-old asks their mother, mommy why, you know, um, and you keep on ask, answering the question, eventually you get to the root cause, okay? So we're gonna do the five whys. Why metals? Why are people interested in metals rather than, why do you just go with ceramics and plastics? And the answer is, why not plastics? I mean, we do plastics by 3D printing. Why do we want to do metals? This is part of material selection, folks. And this actually does relate to material selection. Plastics just can't take the temperature. They can't take the heat, right? What's the highest temperature plastic you can think of? Silicone rubber. Okay, you can buy little kitchen tools, pay a premium, and they come in sil silicone rubber and they'll go to 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Woo! Okay, go build a, a heat engine at 500 degree Fahrenheit maximum. Okay, it won't be very efficient. So you'd like something that goes to higher temperatures. Well, ceramics can take higher temperatures than even metal. Why don't we use ceramics? They're brittle. Back in the mid-1980s, people in the ceramics community was telling the world, oh, why are you using metals? Ceramics are not corrosive, or they're not prone to corrosion. They can go to even higher temperatures. We want to build jet engines out of ceramics. And I remember, I, well, I spent 1984 and 85, my first sabbatical year in Tokyo, Japan, working for the Office of Edward Search, and they had something called ceramics fever. And they had a, a ceramics high-tech showcase in Shinjuku, if you know, uh, Tokyo. And they had two million people come to it. The Japanese were just enamored with fine ceramics. And ceramics were going to take over the world, okay? And metals were just a, a thing of the past. And I'll show you some other things from that era and afterwards where people said, oh, we don't need metals. We could use ceramics. Well, ceramics are real, okay? And we're going to talk about that why we don't use ceramics for critical structure applications. It turns out metals have very good fracture toughness. And then it's not just strength. If you want to use the best science of 1880s, okay, then you could use ceramics, okay? They used to use cast iron to build the railroads for Andrew Carnegie and stuff. They used steel too. Uh, but but um, they built the railroads with a lot of brittle materials, and then people learned to start doing tensile tests in the 1880s to measure the strength. But ceramics are extremely brittle, can be extremely brittle. You might know how to cut glass. You ever cut glass? How do you do it? I want everybody glass working. I think you just score it, right? And you take a little, yeah, you take a, a carbide wheel, okay? Just, I actually have one in there. Or you can take a diamond scribe and you just scratch it. And it turns out it's so brittle that you can put a little scratch in a ceramic and um, it can be a thousandth of an inch deep, 25 microns deep. And if you whack it right there, you don't have to hit it hard, just give it a little whack, it'll break right where you scratch it. Okay? And you go watch some glass cutter or they go down to the glass lab here, they take a metal file and they want to cut the cut the ceramic off the rod, the blow pipe that they're, they're uh, using to, to make their, their art object. Just take a metal file and they put a little score in the hot glass and they, they just tap it on the tape. It just breaks right off. It'd be a half inch in diameter. Okay. Is that what you want? Okay. Um, and when I came back from Japan, I used to give a talk um, about the fact that ceramics were not very good because the ceramist had not learned about the property of fracture toughness. The, the property of fracture toughness was <coughs> first discovered in about 1925 by a guy named Griffith in England. And Griffith was trying to study the fracture of glass. And he came up with a formula, which we'll talk about later, which is the fundamental equation of fracture mechanics. And it basically says the toughness of the material is proportional to the strength. I'll write it down, it's a simple formula. The, the fracture toughness um, must be greater than the stress applied times the square root of pi 
times the half length of the crack, or the edge crack. If it's an edge crack, it's just the C is the length of the crack. So that's C right there. It's the length of the edge crack. If it's an embedded crack, it's 2C, okay, would be the length. Um, but that's the formula. Um, and that's the fundamental equation of fracture mechanics. We didn't really pay attention to fracture mechanics until World War II. Anybody know what happened in World War II? They taught us about fracture mechanics? Uh, that was the 1950s. That was afterwards, but that's similar, and that is fracture mechanics, yes. Uh, there's a class of ships that would undergo a uh, real Yep, it's called the Liberty Ships, and we built about 5,000 of them to carry troops and supplies to, to the out of North America to where they were fighting the war. And some of these ships, I should have brought it, I have the picture of the 1946 report, and it shows the whole ship is broken into from a pearl fracture. And it turns out the Navy thought, this is not a good thing. Okay, that ship is completely breaking into. And so they, um, um, they had an inquiry, and they found that fracture toughness was just as important as strength. And that's one of the things you're going to learn when we talk about structure materials. Force is the energy of fracture. I mean, force is the is the strength of the material in terms of tensile strength. Um, it's the force of fracture, but toughness is the energy of fracture. Okay, and both force and energy are important to a structural material. Okay, the force is the strength of the material, but the toughness is the ability to resist fracture. Okay. In fact, uh, one guy who was head of aircraft engines for uh, materials for aircraft engines at General Electric, a guy named Bob Sprague, said once that um, uh, physicists think that, that uh, structure controls properties of materials, but metallurgists know that defects can control the strength of the material. Those little flaws that Griffith was studying caused the fracture of the glass, and they caused the fracture of the steel ships that the Navy built in World War II. Okay, now they didn't all fail that way, but even out of 5,000 ships, I've got the statistics in the report, I don't know, something like 40 of them separate, uh, separated, had major, major cracks, and several of them just completely split to, um, because of a brittle fracture. So fracture toughness and strength are both important. We don't use plastics for all applications. We use them for many applications because they don't have high temperature capability. We don't use ceramics in many cases because they're brittle. Metals basically have 10 times the strength and high temperature, okay? Well, why not metals if we're gonna do 3D printing? Why can't we do it? Well, they have certain properties that make the 3D printing difficult, okay, at best. Difficult at best, it's now been 25 years since Ellie Sachs and Mike Sema first did 3D printing and since, I can't remember the guy's name in, in Texas, but the 30 years since he first did stereo lithography, okay? Well, one is mechanical. Just like we want the mechanical properties, it turns out certain properties of metals like thermal expansion and volume change on solidification, which are mechanical features of the materials, and if I wanted to know something about some of these properties, I'm giving you a, a plus note version of why we don't do it. Um, you can go to a book uh, by a guy, Mike Ashby, it's in his fourth edition. Ashby was a professor at Harvard. He's British by background. He went back to Cambridge, uh, retired from Cambridge. Um, brilliant material scientist and mechanical engineer in terms of design. And he wrote this book, um, Material Selection and Mechanical Design. If I had to pick a book, a single book, to be the textbook for this course, this is what I'd pick. Okay? And so we'll be going through this sometimes. He's written a, bu a bunch of books, and he came up with something that are now known as Ashby Plots. Uh, and this is from the first edition. The first edition of the book, which cost $300, had this nice little uh, pamphlet at the end, which has no copyright in it. You, if you read it carefully, you'll find that he, he basically has these plots, 
And he wants you to be able to copy them, hand them out to students. And so here's a plot, an attribute plot. He likes to, to plot things on log-log scales. As Professor Sadoway said, his, one of his teachers at the University of Toronto said, if you plot something on a log-log scale and you don't get a straight line, then you've got something really wrong. Okay? Almost everything's a straight line on a log-log plot. But not everything is a straight line on a log-log plot. This is a plot of thermal expansion versus uh, thermal conductivity. And we go, typically his plots go over about five orders of magnitude. Thermal conductivity in watts per meter Kelvin from a hundredth to a thousand. Turns out all materials can fall on this simple five orders of magnitude plot. If we talk about linear expansion coefficient in uh, degrees per degree Kelvin, actually it's 10 to the minus, well, um, um, anyway, here are your engineering ceramics. They have low coefficient of thermal expansion. That's good. Your metals are higher than ceramics. Uh, your elastomers, rubbers, have the largest coefficients of thermal expansion, but they have low thermal conductivity. Metals have among the highest thermal conductivity and thermal expansion. And that's one of the things that kills you when you're trying to melt the little pieces of metal on top of other pieces of metal. Okay? So we can do ceramics, which we do at room temperature. We can do polymers over here, have lousy thermal conductivity. But because of these particular properties of the metal, it makes it very difficult to do 3D printing. So the other problem is you're going to melt it and let it solidify. Well, the problem is for aluminum, 6% volume change on solidification. For iron, 3.5%. Uh, you probably never had the experience of trying to go and find, look up the volume change on solidification. You won't find it tabulated. Anybody know how you get the volume change on solidification? In the literature? You look up the density of the liquid, you look up the density of the, the solid, and you calculate it from that. Because one of them is the inverse of the volume, the other, well, they're both the inverse of the volume. One's the inverse of the liquid, one's the inverse of the solid volume, and you calculate it from the densities. You'll find the densities tabulated. You won't find the volume change on solidification tabulated. But you can get it, okay? It's there, and just present it in a different way. But that's a pretty good change, and that's going to lead to stresses in the material, and those are going to be residual stresses in the final part. And it turns out, if you try to make a big part like this, Okay, we're going to have something that's three quarters of an inch by three quarters of an inch. The odds are that it may crack from internal residual stresses once you get much bigger than about a centimeter in dimension. Okay? Because you've got that big volume change, and the big volume change leads to residual stresses. Residual stresses can lead to cracking even in the nice ductile material. So you got a residual stress problem. Okay? That's, so those are the mechanical problems we have to worry about. Then there's certain melting problems, okay? The first one is some of these things have very, very tenacious oxide. Aluminum. Aluminum forms an oxide. Now, you could do the whole thing in a vacuum system, but if you take the welding module, you'll find, anybody know how long it takes for the oxide to form on a piece of aluminum? Or what I usually do is I take a piece of chalk, a big piece of chalk, a small piece of chalk, and I fracture it right before your very eyes, okay? And I form two new surfaces. How long did it take for a monolayer of gas atoms to contaminate the surface of that new fracture? Pardon me? A nanosecond. Well, actually, 10 nanoseconds. Very close. 10 to the minus 8 seconds. It's a term called the Langmuir. After Irving Langmuir, who was an engineer at General Electric around the turn of the 20, beginning of the 20th century, and he studied surfaces, he's trying to understand why tungsten worked best for light bulbs, uh, and there was evaporation. So the Langmuir uh, basically, uh, anyways, he 
he studied evaporation of tungsten from tungsten filaments and light bulbs and stuff. But he won the Nobel Prize for studying evaporation and studying surface contamination. And if you go through the kinetic theory of gases at one atmosphere pressure, turns out the Langmuir, we call it the Langmuir, is about 10 to the minus 8 atmosphere seconds. That's for, you can get it out of the kinetic theory of gases, that's how long it takes for gas molecules in the air at one atmosphere of pressure to form a monolayer and cover the surface by contaminating it. Well, it doesn't take very long. If you're going to try to do 3D printing, you can reduce the pressure. You can try to do it at 10 minus 8 atmospheres. We have vacuums that will go that low. And then you have to be able to do all your 3D printing in one second. So you're probably not going to get rid of the oxides. Okay? But that doesn't mean that people who study nanotechnology have learned that there are such things as oxides that form on metals. Okay? Um, and some of these are very stable. Aluminum oxide in particular is extremely stable. So is magnesium oxide. The, the other problem is surface tension. Uh, surface tension is a property that metals have in abundance, in a sense. Okay? Uh, the surface tension of a metal Metals have about 10 times the surface energy of nonmetals. Uh, the surface energy of metal is typically about one joule per square meter. Uh, it doesn't really matter whether it's low temperature metal like lead tin solder that you might want to make a printed circuit board out of, or high temperature steel. The steel might be one and a half joules per square meter. The solder might be 0.7, but you know, within a small number, they're about the same. There's something, and I didn't know this until this morning, good old uh, Wikipedia. I always called it the bond number, but the, what's, anybody know how to pronounce that word in Hungarian? It's close, apparently, this must have been written for Wikipedia by some European, because it basically says, the term Itos number is most frequently used in Europe, and while the bond number is commonly used in other parts of the world, but basically, Loran Itos, uh, and uh, Wilfred Noel Bond, who's a little bit younger, uh, discovered this number, and it's just the ratio of the uh, uh, gravity forces to the surface tension forces, okay, of a liquid. And it turns out, for a typical metal, anybody, well, you probably wouldn't know, um, but the gravity force is equal to the surface tension force for a metal when it's about an eighth of an inch in diameter. And here's a picture out of a soldering book for a printed circuit board that shows if you put more and more solder on a wire going through a via in a printed circuit board, uh, when the, and you know, this might be a millimeter wire, when you have a little bit of solder, you can get the surface tension to defy gravity because if the bond number is a tenth, I didn't show you, but it goes as the length squared. And so if, the, if you're a millimeter, that's the, the surface tension forces here would be ten times the gravity forces, but you get larger and larger, and essentially things start slumping on, over, under gravity. And the two forces are equal at a, for metals at about <coughs> one eighth of an inch or three millimeters. Here you can see the bond number goes as L squared, dimension squared. Sigma is the surface tension. Um, uh, delta rho is the change in density. And G is gravity. So that basically means if I'm trying to, you now know why you can't print, print a circuit board. You try to put a drop of metal on a printed circuit board and it's going to ball up on you by surface tension. That little drop, how much smaller is that than an eighth of an inch? It's a lot smaller than an eighth of an inch. And the surface tension forces dominate over all gravity forces. And unless you shot it through there on a cold substrate to have it go splat, okay, you won't get a nice thin layer that you want from a printed circuit board. 
Motorola's tried it, the Intel's tried it, you name the companies, everybody's tried it 25 years ago, and everyone gave up. Because properties of the metal, in terms of surface tension, um, are way different than any of these other um, non-metallic materials. So then there's also, aside from the bond number, there's something called the Fourier number. Anybody know what the Fourier number deals with? Chemical engineers, you should know this. Materials engineers should know it too. Typically, don't wear it. Fourier was a scientist in uh, Joseph Fourier uh, in the 1800s, and he studied heat transfer. And the Fourier number is the diffusive transport rate over the well, storage storage rate. But anyway, uh, it's basically the thermal conductivity over the length squared. How how fast can heat diffuse? Alpha is the thermal diffusivity of the material. L is the length. How fast does heat go into a material? Okay. Turns out metals have, well, the Fourier number controls the heat transfer. You're going to melt a metal. You're going to 3D print it. And it's going to solidify. And you also have to know something about the Prandtl number. And the Prandtl number is the viscous diffusion rate divided by the thermal diffusion rate. And it's going to flow and solidify. And here's your K is thermal conductivity. This K over rho C sub B is the thermal, is the thermal diffusivity. This is thermal conductivity. Mu is the kinematic viscosity. Uh, yeah. no. um, mu is the dynamic viscosity. Sorry. No, 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 no. But it turns out. If you don't say heat transfer, metals are in a class by themselves in terms of the final number. They just they conduct heat really well compared to most other materials. And in fact, if we went back to the uh, Ashby plot, you see that. You see that The ratio of the Prandtl number, which is thermal over uh, 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 thermal, well, this is thermal expansion, but thermal conductivity over uh, this viscosity, which I don't have here. But metals are very high in thermal conductivity. Uh, they have very low viscosity compared to polymers and some other things. And metal ceramics, we can't even melt uh, unless we get to ridiculously high temperatures. So thermal conductivity is also a problem. It turns out if we go to the Fourier equation, Fourier's first law says that the heat intensity is minus the thermal conductivity times the temperature gradient. And you're splatting this metal against this metal substrate. The thermal conductivity of metals is high, the highest of anything except sort of diamond. The, if your substrate is cool, okay, it's cold, DTDX, you got a big, you're sucking the heat out of there quickly and you got a big DTDX. If this is large and this is large, you'd better have a big heat source, very intense heat source. And that means that Q must be large. That means your only choice is to use lasers or electron beams to do your 3D printing of metals. And we know that. I didn't expect you to know all these things necessarily. But we know this, if we go to an article written by some guy named Tom Eager 20 years ago, um, and we look at the heat intensity on the surface of, of something, Q has units. The Q is minus K D T D X. The Fourier number Q has units of watts per square centimeter. If I look at a, a little plumber's torch, okay? an air fuel gas flame. That's around 100 watts per square centimeter. That would burn your finger if you put your finger in the flame. If you wanted to know where it is on a sunny day, we haven't had one of those recently, but actually yesterday was too bad. But a sunny day is around 10 to the minus, is that about 0.3 watts per square centimeter. 0.3, it's two and a half orders bang too small than a little plumber's torch. An arc weld is around 10,000 watts per square centimeter. Okay, lasers and electron beams are up here around a million watts per square centimeter. So we're talking a little over two or three million 
times more heat intensity than the sun on a nice sunny day. Now you can get more than that on a sunny day. You can, if you want to build, burn the amps on the sidewalk, you get a little magnifying and focus it. That'll get you up to about 10 watts per square centimeter. You can burn paper. Okay, and a son who lived in Panaka, uh, Nevada once, and it gets up to 140, 130 there. So he went out one day, cracked an egg, went on the sidewalk, see if he could fry it. And you can. Okay. And in Panaka, you can you cook your breakfast on the sidewalk. When it gets to 130 degrees, that's enough story. Anyway, heat transfer is another problem in all of this stuff. So it turns out, why don't we do 3D printing of metals? Well, there are a couple of applications that I could think of. One is the application of printed circuit boards. And it's fairly easy to explain that you can't do printed circuit boards because the surface tension defeats you. Uh, anyway. Um, but you could also try, if you wanted, to make bigger parts. Uh, and the bigger parts would be things that I was trying to do for the Navy. Um, what had happened is, in 1992, peace broke out with the former Soviet Union. And the US Navy had been spending money, they had spent about a quarter billion dollars building particle beam weapons physicists at building these multi-megavolt electron beams, and the idea was they were going to be able to shoot down an incoming missile that was going to be fired at some aircraft carrier or something, and they just take this multi-megavolt electron beam and they just fire it right at the missile, knock it out of the sky 30 miles away. Well, they built these things, and they couldn't quite get 30 miles. They actually could get a straight beam for about 30 inches. Okay, they were a little off. Uh, and then peace broke out, so they didn't really need them. And they called me up and they said, uh, we're trying to find an application. We don't want to lose our funding. Uh, can, we use, can we use these things to weld a submarine? And I looked at it. Well, these, you need about 10, 20, 30 kilowatts of power to make a, an arc weld, OK, to melt that much metal. But these things had a megawatt. I said, well, maybe you could melt the submarine. You're not going to weld it with these things. And then I got to think, about, well, you know, when you build something like an aircraft carrier, it costs about $15 billion. And about $5 billion is that is for the whole mechanical and electrical. The other $10 billion is for the nuclear weapons and the air aircraft. Uh, but that $5 billion for the ship is still a fair amount of money. And you have to spend a couple hundred million dollars buying spares. And by spares, we mean great big valves, great big castings, things that would have a one or two year lead time if they cracked. Okay? This could be a major seawater valve, or it could be a, it could be a tail shaft okay, to the propellers. And if you go and you try to order one of those, you can't go to Home Depot and get a 30 inch diameter tail shaft. Okay? They don't carry them at Home Depot. Okay? And if you went to order one from a Ford shop, they'd quote you about a year, year and a half time to forge one for you, okay? And even if you use the title that allows the Defense Department to come in and take over a, a factory, you still probably couldn't get one in less than three or four months. And you can't have a capital ship out of service for three or four months because it has no propeller, right? So the, my idea is, well, maybe we could use these multi-megavolt electron beams to overcome some of these problems in 3D printing. Um, and build up things. And it turns out one of the problems in 3D printing of metals, and it's not like some people say that we haven't done it. This, when I mentioned this to Dr. Bomar last week, he brought me this little part. Okay? And maybe I'll pass it around tomorrow since we only got a couple of minutes. This is a laser printed 3D metal part. Okay? It's got some holes and stuff in it. It's got a kind of a rough surface because that's the melted surface and the surface tension. And on the back side, it's nice and flat. Anyway, we'll pass it around tomorrow. He said, this costs $500 for this little part. And I said, it must have taken two or three hours to make. And he didn't know exactly how long it took to make. But I know it would take two or three hours because you've got to lay down very thin layers of like metal powders. Not drops, but very thin layers of metal powders and then melt them. 
so they stay nice and thin and they don't ball up on you. Okay? So your melt pool has to be very small. And in fact, it can't be very large if you try to go to a higher power then good old Langmuir comes in and he starts evaporating all, away all your energy. And you just start forming welding fuel in the atmosphere. So you have a thermal conductivity limitation on your productivity of how fast you can make these. I mean, how many grams was that at $500, you know, to make that part? How many, you know, what's that? Thousands of dollars a pound. Well, you're not going to be making additive manufacturing automotive parts at that price, folks. Cost is still a problem. So it turns out um, you can use lasers and electron beams. It turns out the US Navy actually tried to do this when uh, Pat and Whitney developed a 25 kilowatt laser back in 1975, sort of a researchy type of thing. And um, they said, well, why don't you make a turbine disc? Okay, so they gave them a million dollars or something. It took them a month to make a six inch turbine disc. They had a mandrel sort of like this and they just went around and around. But because the laser has such a high heat intensity, if you try to put in more heat, all you do is evaporate more off the surface. So you can't get more heat in. You put it down a very thin layer. They made it, it took them a month to make this five inch diameter turbine disc. So they did do 3D printing in middle this back in 1975. Just sort of a financial disaster. Um, so I decided we could use multi megavolt electron beams because electron beams, not being like lasers that use photons, use electrons, I can actually deposit my heat beneath the surface. The electrons, the million volt electrons actually deposit the heat about a half a millimeter deep. And so I could go much faster. Rather than doing a 10 microns at a time on each pass, I could melt something much thicker. And in fact, we did. We set up with an electron beam, and this is some stainless steel, and this we'll show it to you when we have more time next time. But um, I could do this, and I determined that I could make big 3D metal parts and lay down metal at 500 pounds an hour. We did the calculations, 500 pounds an hour. And so instead of buying a couple hundred million dollars worth of spares, you could have just a computer disk of the CAD, uh, CAD valve that you're going to tail shaft that you're going to build for the Navy. And when someone needed it, you could build up a new one at 500 pounds an hour, which means in a week's time you could have the casting. Except we hadn't gotten rid of the residual stresses, it was going to crack on us. But we had a way to take care of that. We were going to use that laser or electron beam, and we were going to send a shock wave through it. We we're going to use the Grunheisen effect, where if you hit it with enough power density, like 10 to the 8th watts per square centimeter. You can send a 400 KSI shock wave through it, and you can get rid of the residual stresses by a shock stress relief. And we even proved you could do that. We could get rid of the residual stresses. Works. Just no one wanted to give me $10 million to build this thing. You'd have to dig a pit about four stories in the ground to shield yourself from the x-rays. Because no one could go there while you're actually doing it. Okay. So we could do it. And I'll tell you a little bit more tomorrow about someone else who a year ago was using a laser up here in Woburn, Massachusetts, and they were making medical instruments, and they, they were making uh, aerospace parts, and they had a big fire, because the fuel that comes off the fire for it, and the guy got very bad in the burn. Okay. So, we can make 3D metal parts, there's a problem.